This is Hacker Public Radio episode 3128 for Wednesday the 29th of July 2020. Today's show is entitled Linux in Laws Season 1 Episode 11 The Python Bumper Part 2 and is part of the series Linux in Laws. It is hosted by Monochrome X and is about 68 minutes long and carries an explicit flag. The summary is the chaps continue to shed more light on our beloved programming language. This episode of HBR is brought to you by anhonesthost.com. Get 15% discount on all shared hosting with the offer code HBR15. That's HBR15. Better web hosting that's honest and fair at anhonesthost.com. <laughs> is Linux in Laws, a podcast on topics around free and open source software, any associated contraband, communism, the revolution in general, and whatever else fancies your tickle. Please note that this and other episodes may contain strong language, offensive humor, and other certainly not politically correct language. You have been warned. Our parents insisted on this disclaimer. Happy mum! Thus, the content is not suitable for consumption in the workplace, especially when played back on a speaker in an open plan office or similar environments. Any minors under the age of 35 or any pets, including fluffy little killer bunnies, your trusted guide dog, unless on speed, and cute T-Rexes or other associated dinosaurs. This is Linux in Laws, Season 1, Episode 11. The Python Bumper Part 2. Good morning, Martin. How are things? Good morning, Chris. I'm good. How are you? Is can't a, can't um, complain. Uncompla- well, I could, complain. but that, what's, what's yes. the point anyway? It's not, not a very good use of energy, indeed. Um, but some, some, some countries make a national uh, sport about this. Uh, the, would, the Dutch would be one of them? Uh, no, the, sorry, no, the I English. It's, it's, <laughs> My mistake. Yes, indeed. Deed. The tea is too warm. <laughs> the weather is too hot. The weather it rains it, it rains the beer's a too lot. Cold, exactly. Yeah. The beer is too cold. <laughs> the beer is not warm enough. That sort of thing. Exactly. Indeed. So yes. before we so, um, yeah, before we get start with the second part of our of our bumper episode about Python, let's talk indeed. about news. I understand that you lost some money recently. Uh, not not personally, you know, I, but um, <laughs> the, the time the timing is perfect. <clears throat> Yes, so today's, um, for me, today's episode is a little bit about hacking. Uh, one being Hacker Public Radio, which has clearly been hacked because one of our episodes mentioned something about two OAPs episode, and I'm not entirely sure who put this uh, in. Yeah, that so was me, actually. I'm sure um, it must have been. Because we are old, there's no point in denying this, Martin. There's no point in, living in, in even living in denial. Well, I'm not sure about you, but I'm certainly not drawing a pension. So well, I you can, are can, can't possibly. You are <laughs> over fifty, right? So that's <laughs> just, close just. to a pension years age, no? You're planning to retire soon on your magnificent share I, options. I, 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 I can't really talk about this in public. <laughs> I could if it was just for oh, the share options, no, anyway. I see. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, this brings me on to the second point of the news. You are obviously already retired on the back of your 1.9 billion. You uh, managed to. Siphon off. <laughs> if anybody's listening, this is known in the trade as a false accusation. Well, you have to 
obviously pretend this is Martin, otherwise. I'm not in jail. Be on I'm, to you pretty, this pretty, is not, <laughs> pretty quick. I'm not doing this recording in jail. I'm still a free man, <coughs> so... Well, so dear listeners, uh, in, in, if in future <laughs> our dear colleague is, is not, no longer turning up for the recordings, we know why, <laughs> that he has been found out. <laughs> Martin, if I, would be, oh, if I would be having 1.9 billion under my belt right now, I wouldn't be talking to you, rest hmm. short. I don't think it would fit personally. But um, <laughs> also, um, yeah, did, did you not recently visit the Philippines? No, I didn't. But maybe Martin, you... I you see care to elaborate what this is all about <laughs> before, our re before our listeners get even confused more. Oh, I'm sure our listeners have. Yeah, so I mean, this is uh, yet another uh, surprising episode in uh, German company failures. Um, obviously, that was the, uh, the famous German automaker's um, <laughs> Debacle. Martin is getting confused, <laughs> yeah. but that's okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure we all remember Volkswagen. Um, but, um, yeah, so the, the current news is, is our uh, friends at Wirecard, a, a German tech company which has somehow misplaced 1.9 billion of euros. If they and even had it um, to start with, because that's unclear. You might be just looking at book cooking big scale, big time. So, yeah, I mean, the, this is a good good answer. Good answer, yeah. <laughs> and no, Martin, I'm not in possession of it's that good. money. <laughs> in case you're still wondering. <laughs> okay. Uh, we believe you, I'm sure, yes. <laughs> All right. No, it's, it's, uh, it's, yeah, a, so that, it's, it's a bit, it's a bit it's, sad it's because there's a bigger thing, picture involved. Yeah. Um, what do you know about BaFin, Martin, in this context? About who, how much? The BaFin? No, the BaFin. Bundesaufsicht für Finanzdienstleistung or something like this. Ah, Our see. national regulator, um, compared to the it's, FSA. It's, 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 it sounds like a, gen, <coughs> a, a general German uh, uh, bo uh, that's a government body or some sort. Uh, yeah, they're part of the Federal Ministry of Economics or something. Uh, no, it's essentially, okay. I think in the, in the UK you know them as, as, the, as the FSA, the Financial Security Agency or something like this. Essentially, it's the national regulator. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, for want of a better expression, this podcast is explicit. They fucked up big time too, um, because about what half a year ago, a year ago, something like this, as in last year or the year before, don't quote me. They check. They they actually um, prohibited shortening Wirecard um, um, stock. Nice. Um, and of course, they should have been on top of this, but then they weren't. So our beloved federal minister um, for for finance or even for economics, uh, Altmaier, I, I, I don't remember his, I don't know, I don't remember his exact title, is already mm. calling for a Bafin reform, meaning the whole thing didn't go down too well for the Bafin itself. Okay, I mean, there's also the uh, the question of these, uh, you know, the auditors to be uh, raised. Ernest there, Young, KPMG, yes. Um, already law firms are gearing up with regards to potential compensation claims uh, mm -hmm. because Wirecard just went into receivership as of, I think, Tuesday this week. Mm -hmm. um, there's nothing much to be gained from that company anymore because if you are in receivership, and this is, I reckon, the same in the yep. UK, your assets are pretty much frozen. Uh, nobody really can mm -hmm. get a hold of apart from maybe employees... Um, with regards to get, still getting paid or something. Anyway, it doesn't matter. But um, being a stockholder, you are very at the very bottom of that list, um, meaning these law firms are now take a, taking a very serious look at the auditors to see if well, they yes. can be... Um, 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 what's the word I'm looking for? H held, held accountable. Uh, yes. I, would, I, I was going for, to, uh, <laughs> for a much more explicit description... <laughs> Dragged in Thank front of a court, screaming. That's exactly what it was, was looking for. <laughs> yeah, good, good. That sounds like they need to, right? It's, um, um, you don't yeah, just I think, lose that, that amount of money overnight. Yeah, or, I think or, Ernest well, and Young lose, is the, hide the main auditor here who kind of really apparently screwed up if mm. news coverage is anything to go by. Indeed, indeed. So, yes, not entirely an open source related um, news, but it just sort of... 
Uh, yeah, <coughs> it, it struck st- stood out for me, um, reminded me of the Volkswagen one, and this is, and I'm thinking, what's going on there in Germany? What is Chris doing all this with his spare time? Apparently, Martin has lost an awful lot of money uh, <laughs> that he previously had in Wirecard stock. My consolation, Martin, but don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> There's still the silver lining on the horizon. Just go for these law firms, say you are a stockholder, and then basically they, let's sort you out, maybe. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Anyway, okay, um, uh, my piece of news, yes. Um, yes. A certain Linus Torvald has said that... V- oh, Yes, it. yes. The one with the Linux ca- uh, um, um, thingy there said that the upcoming version fi- uh, 5.8 would be the biggest ever, right? Until 5.9, surely. But hey, um, <coughs> yes. Did we not cover this last Maybe time? Maybe we did. So in that case, we have to cut <laughs> it out. <laughs> I'm sure we covered Linus and 5.8. But, hey. but we could throw in a teaser, actually, of, for, for, for an it. upcoming interview with a certain Leonard Puttering. Ah, yes, of um, reverse glass painting. E- exactly. People, you heard it here first. Leonard has, <laughs> I wouldn't say exactly confirmed, but hopefully promised <laughs> to make an appearance on this show. Probably penciled in for August, September time frame. Um, unfortunately... Um, because of, of of Martin's previous ranting about Pulse, he explicitly said, we cannot talk about Avahi, we cannot talk about Pulse, we cannot talk about System D. So, Martin, you cannot mention Dev1, the, your beloved distro that you're using left, right, and center. We cannot we cannot do this. So, no, we can mention so it's, it's, it's it a short interview so in that it's case. It's strictly <laughs> about Buddhism, it's strictly about reverse glass painting and calligraphy. This is what we agreed on, right? No open store stuff. If it, if I'm, sh- I'm sure the, uh, our, our listeners will look forward to that. <laughs> especially, <laughs> especially no controversial things like System D, right? That's the important bit. Mm, mm. So, people, if you, want to, if you ever wanted to hear Lana Pettering's views on reverse glass painting, that's the episode to check out. More later. Uh, let's leave Your it at that. Capitalism as well. Yes. Yep, yep, yep. <laughs> and yep. let's cut over, rather, now to the second part of our bump episode on Python. The following contains the second part of the two-part Python miniseries. As listeners who checked out the previous episode may recall, our two chaps were discussing the different concurrency models offered by Python and how they are mapped onto operating system kernel and user land mechanisms. In case this doesn't ring a bell, please go back to Season 1, Episode 10 for the details. Okay, um, I hope that explains the significant difference performance-wise between mere user land abstractions like whole routines and the more heavy stuff sorry, the heavier stuff rather to use correct English, uh, when it comes down to multiprocessing, multithreading. Of course, you you all have these abstractions as part of the standard library that Python mm. offers. There's something called the multiprocessing module um, mm-hmm. that contains these, uh, these abstractions. Um, while we're on the subject of stack list, there's also a very important, well, is, is that the word? Is that the correct word? Um, sure. An interesting, an interesting development. Let's put it this way: the language community, and this is penciled in for Python 3.10, is actively thinking about something called subinterpreters. Uh, bef- okay. Before I go into the details, let me take a step back here. Um, what do you know about the GIL, Martin? The Global Interpreter Loop. Global Interpreter Loop. Yeah. yeah. Yes. So I mean, this is obviously um, similar to any. Locking mechanism if you have uh, concurrent, uh, in this case, threads. Um, uh, as you explained, um, accessing the same address space, uh, someone has to have a view of who is currently dealing with it. Yes. The global interpreter lock um, is what it says on the tin. Essentially, it's a mm. lock inside C Python that controls concurrent access to various bits and pieces inside the language runtime. And the idea is with subinterpreters to essentially have more than one interpreter, and I think, if I'm not completely mistaken, with separate guilds running inside 
one or separate or, or, or different processes um, more often than not, of course, for performance reasons inside the same address space, hmm. meaning you have something very similar to async IO um, without the expense of having to do a context switch if when you wanted to switch to a different address space. I mm -hmm. think it's penciled in, as I said, for for Python 3.10. It would be interesting to see how this yeah. develops in terms of giving a chunk of Python code their own interpreter with their own gil in terms of yeah. increased concurrency um, on a C Python level. And needless to say, similar to, to coroutines and other approaches, and stackless, of course, the idea is not to bother the kernel with context switches, yeah. but rather keep it efficient on a user dead level, i.e. it remains in C Python and thus doesn't and the kernel doesn't get involved with regards to expensive operations. Okay, so uh, yeah, it's um I mean it's all interesting stuff. I mean it's for me it's been I've been quite far removed from the OS for a long time since uh, uh, back in the day when I studied at university. This and, is the trouble uh, when you involve yourself just too much with database administration, Martin. <laughs> I think you yeah. leave. Uh, you, uh, I mean, databases have concurrency and lots of us. Yes, <laughs> similar concept. But, yeah. but um, <laughs> they're boring. <laughs> yeah, and I, I can see the. Um, I used to think operating systems were boring, but uh, there's, I have a, a you have new view, Martin, you, view on it again. Martin, <laughs> you have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Okay. Um, where were we? Can I help you with um, any other uh, Python-related <laughs> related questions now? Yeah, you lost my train of thought. Uh, okay, let's go back to where we what we're doing. I'll come it will come back to me at some point. Right, so, um, yeah, so we talked about uh, why people use Python, what's it good for, um, a bit about the uh, compiler side and stackless and the multi-processing parts of it. Um, so you mentioned Python 3.10, Python 3.9, why, for example... Oh, wait, 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 wait. Yeah, yeah. Martin. Hang on. The focus group. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Market, focus group. Marketing just sent a mail. The, fo <laughs> the focus group The focus group is missing from this discussion. Is missing... Focus is missing... Uh, what does it say here in the mail? Um, <laughs> um, compiler type, type checking. Yes. Yes. Um, yes, okay. Do you, do you have any idea why the focus group came up with this? Because they have a because, point there. Well, um, apart from that, marketing as usual did a proper job here. Well, no, I mean this is because developers are useless, <laughs> which is why we have compilers to people, check their mistakes. <laughs> people, you, we're going to cut this out. I hope. <laughs> <laughs> because as insulting uh -huh. listeners, insulting listeners on podcasts, especially open source ones, is not really on Martin. <laughs> you think we have a developer amongst our five listeners? Do you? I think we, we a we have more than five. To, uh, we have more than five listeners, maybe six. I don't know. I know it's pushing it, but certainly a fair share of them would be developers. Yes. Okay. Fair enough. Okay. Martin, um, what are the yes. what are the advantages of strongly typed programming languages coming from a SQL background? I might add. From a SQL background, yes. Well, I mean, databases have types, right? Indeed, I mean, the main, the main they thing do. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the, the advantage of any typing system is that you allocate the minimum amount of space for whatever it is you're trying to store. Yes, um, so far so good. That 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 that's one. The second is obviously uh, you are able to um, execute the appropriate functions uh, with it, or, or uh, yeah, if that's the right terminology. Basically, you don't want to um, uh, do any arithmetic on strings and that way around, right? So it's 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 basically preventing um, errors in in code by checking it at compile time rather than when it is running. Uh, basically saying, you know, if uh, I've declared something as a string, I can't do 
uh, you know, the square root of it, right? Excellent, excellent, excellent. Any more? Have I oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm just wondering, does the, pro- does the programming language called Rust ring a bell? Well, it's one of these hipster. Me- no, 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 you mentioned this. There's, there's this German guy who keeps talking about it. It's one of these hipster <laughs> languages strongly typed. <laughs> Uh, yes. yes, for those few listeners who, Very good. who do not know yeah. Rust uh, yet, it's a programming language that has been developed by Mozilla since 2010. It's the I'm I'm almost tempted to say the ultimate goal or the wet dream of strongly typed languages. Um, mm. The idea was to develop a low-level system-oriented programming language with extremely okay. to- strong typing. And in contrast to C++ and other approaches, mm. um, Rust has, or one of the ultimate aims of Rust is to be able to generate extremely efficient code. Um, and also to cut down on testing efforts. So there's actually a saying in the Rust community, if you can convince the compiler to produce code, you're almost done. <laughs> because the Rust compiler does one thing very well. It mm. takes your code apart and puts it back together again. Um, okay. It goes... Uh, Rust has a couple of traits. And and before I loop back to Python, let me explain a little bit okay. to you. Okay. For example, yeah, okay. Rust, for example, doesn't have garbage collection, unlike Golang and other compiled strong type languages. Strongly uh-huh. typed languages, rather. Mm. Um it relies on sophisticated memory concepts like ownership, borrowing, and so forth. Hmm. Rustlang.org is your go-to source, people, if you want to know more about it. But one of the side effects of the strongly typed language, and with the in combination with these concepts, is that you are, being a Rust compiler, that you're able to literally do an awful lot of type checking already at compile time. So you yep. know, for example, at any given time who owns a variable, you know the scope of the variable. And mm. so you can do an awful lot of optimizations already at compile time and doesn't have to refer this to runtime. Like, for example, some of the just-in-time compilers do it. Java probably mm. being the best example. Um, um, so you can you are able to generate machine code then and there. And you're also able, because you did a thorough analysis of the of, of the code, you're also able to generate very efficient machine code. And this is kind of the ultimate goal. And Python, on the other side, has wasn't developed with that goal in mind because the idea was to shift type checking to shift type checking mm-hmm. um, from the com- compilation phase, which isn't really there anyway, because essentially what a, what C Python does, it takes a program code. Um, parses it, constructs an uh, abstract syntax tree, as explained before, and then executes mm-hmm. an intermediate code generated from this AST. And only then the type checking does take place. For example, if you are defining class in Python um, that has a certain f- fingerprint in terms of uh, the methods you define the you define in this class and these methods of course have their own signatures in terms of what variables um, they define uh, these variables typically do not have a type so you can pass whatever you want to it so it's up to C Python at runtime to determine if the variables for example match the signature or even if a particular member function is part of a class definition. It cannot do this at compile time because it doesn't have a compile time as such. It has to do this at runtime. Also, for mm-hmm. example, if you have inheritance, it is in contrast to other languages like Java or C++, it's only determined at runtime what particular polymorphic function is invoked. And, of course, that costs time. So... um the idea was at some stage to introduce a somewhat gentle typing approach. You'll see this actually in the perhaps in the in the Python enhancement proposals, yeah. where people more initially more on the IDE front decided to introduce types in terms of tell the IDE what types they have in mind when they, for example, implement a function. The idea was, of course, to give the IDE a hint 
to do some sort of checking already at editing time. Meaning, if you hand over a, a piece of Python code to the interpreter, um, the chances that your program will bark at you because CPython is not able to execute the program correctly because you've made a mistake is less than before. Meaning, if you take a look at PyCharm, if you take a look at Visual Studio Code, all the mm -hmm. plugins um, for Python, to some extent at least, support typing already. Meaning, if you annotate your 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 source code, right. the IDE is already able to give you hints of what's working at what and what might cause problems at runtime. Sure. Um, it goes without saying that, from a language standard perspective, this typing is purely optional. It's in the PEPs. Indeed, yeah, it's yeah, in yeah, the yeah. PEPs, but you don't have to do yeah. it. You can hand yeah. off the Python code to your C Python to your C Python interpreter. He without typing, he'll execute it happily. But the idea is, of course, to save money and time before you even execute the program. This is the overall concept behind this. Mm -hmm. Makes sense so far? Yeah, yeah, that's what, no, I mean, it's, uh, I do like uh, the small amount of time I spent on Rust um, as well, I have to say. You did, sp um, you, you did spend time on Rust. What did you do? What did I do? Well, I, I looked at some of the links she gave me. <laughs> ah! <laughs> You cut, you copied and pasted some of the Rust by example things and wondered what they do. <laughs> uh, I, I, I decided to read the accompanying blurb as well. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> it's a bit people, more that, people, yeah. not all hope is lost. We may be able to turn Martin Visser at the tender age of. <laughs> okay, let's pass on this one <laughs> into a hipster programmer at the end of the day. Hopefully, this is the ultimate game. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, compared to. Um, I say Python, it doesn't have the whole uh, modules behind it, right? Oh, so it does. It's called the Cargo Ecosystem. The, the, yes, it's but on, not in the same same uh, vastness, let's put it that way. Uh, Being considerably you wanna, younger. You want to double check this. Okay. Um, Python, uh, Python has at least four web frameworks that come to mind immediately. Django Flask and the other ones are, 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 are Pyramid and something else. The two I can't remember. Mm. Rust has four to choose from. Okay. The difference being 15 years. Mm. Rust is about 10, Python 25 plus. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Um, yeah. If you take a look at the last Stack Overflow language survey, I think Rust was among the top five languages. There's a reason mm. for that. The ac the eco the ecosystem is is developing rapidly with Rust. Just take a look and at crate is... at crates.io. This is your go to so that is this is your go to source similar to Py to the Python package index for packages. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's called Cargo, isn't it? Mm. Um, yeah. So chances are similar to Python, there might be a crate with the functionality already being implemented that you're looking for in Rust. Okay, okay, that's fair. Um, hmm, I haven't I hadn't got that far yet, as in uh, writing... I think that's chapter 5 in the book. It's, uh, it's quite a long book as well, yeah, which is very long. <laughs> long books yes, program really languages do have the intrinsicacies, and sometimes it does take time <laughs> to learn them, yes. <laughs> So you, I mean, if, anyway, so if you want to go down that route, yeah. a li if so-called life doesn't help, I've, uh, I don't understand. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> yes, I could not resist. <laughs> uh, thank you. Yes, very helpful. Uh, well, this is why we have handy. More than happy to, yes. Uh, te te tech support guys on that. <laughs> very helpful. Um, so what number is, uh, anyway, so what I was going to say was, I mean, popularity of programming language, right? This is, what is this driven by? This is, this is not driven by, uh, how good the modules are or how good, um, the type checking is, right? This is, um, not how things work. No, it's boiled down, it boils down to you do a pretty bot, you do a pretty clever bot implementation that basically <laughs> scrapes uh, the likes of GOB <laughs> and, and Stack Overflow and they and off you go. It's, it's rigged anyway. Mm. People, you didn't hear this. That was a joke. <laughs> Stack, no, well. o Stack Overflow's <laughs> service are not rigged. They are real. For a reason, I might add. <laughs> Stack Overflow, by the way, you're doing a pretty good job. If you're listening, full marks. 
What are the, uh, the ingredients for the popularity counts? Questions answered, if I'm not completely mistaken. And they do a, is that what it is? And, okay. and they do a survey too. Yeah. Um, they have multiple vectors feeding into the survey, and um, um, I think once yeah, again, they do websites I, I, where yeah. you can vote for programming language or technologies in general. Mm. Actually, uh, you're, you're wrong. The rest is on top now. See, um, that of course mm. makes it one of the top five. <laughs> 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 Just to be correct here, Martin. <laughs> okay, fair enough, fair enough. It is, however, not in the top five of most wanted languages. Okay, fine. Um, mm, interesting point. Sorry, uh, yeah, you can cut this out. I, uh, I've never actually looked at the... I mean, it's the survey part, but I don't know if there's any other part to the stack. There's the also stuff. something called mm. the importance of being earnest, effectively known as Chiobe. That is another language index. No, it's if it's I care to remember, I'm going to put this into the show notes. They have well, it's more a book, than... No, it's a book. It's a book, not a movie. Yeah, uh, no. That came earlier. No, I'm talking about the yes. program language popularity index now. It's, I think it's, okay. a, it's a Danish company... They take more than just Stack Overflow and other and friends mm. into account, but similar to Stack Overflow, they do an annual survey of just programming languages. Okay. In contrast to Stack Overflow, that does a much more encompassing survey, also including database and other middleware. If I'm not completely mistaken. Yeah. Yeah, so Python was the most questioned language. <laughs> I mean, you'll yeah. see this all over the place. For mm -hmm. example, there's this, there's a significant movement in the big data community of mm -hmm. abandoning mm -hmm. R, which has been the standard go-to yes. programming language in yeah. favor of Python. Indeed, this is a bad idea. Never, oh, never mind MATLAB, which is of mm. course proprietary. Yeah, no, I like R. It's a great language, mm. Compa especially compared to Python. Yeah, it's, uh... I mean, and of course, you <laughs> sorry, <laughs> it, um, that remains to be give, seen. Give me uh, R anything. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, <laughs> you probably heard about this. There's this database company that does a pretty popular NoSQL in memory database, and they have recently developed something called Gears that allows you. No. no, 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 Mongo, no, no, Redis uh, Labs. I'm talking about now for a change. Um, and actually, you can script now a one of the most popular NoSQL in-memory DB servers in Python, meaning that you can ship off your Python code to the to the database server, and the database server will execute this as part of a C Python standard implementation on the server itself. I wonder who came up with that idea. Redis Labs. Uh, no, I think it's been done before in databases, but yeah. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, but you see, with, only with <laughs> only with crappy languages like SQL. <laughs> Not with real ones. That's the difference. Ah, I see. Oh, that's, that's, it, they go together, right? Um, Redis Labs, if you're listening, we're opening for sponsoring slots. Do get in touch. I'm just saying. If you think that the car level, if you think that the car level sponsoring is not good enough, get in touch. <laughs> Yes, we may may mention you, you a bit more frequently. <laughs> yeah, we can certainly do something about this. We know our marketing people, so just reach out. Indeed. <laughs> oh, brilliant. Okay. Um, does that bring our Python discussion to an end? No, it doesn't. Uh -huh. I think we so, still have this. Python 3.9. Yes. yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, Noteworthy. A new parser, um, yes, but I think yes. we, I, I touched upon this already. Guido isn't happy with the uh, with the existing um, LL1 parser, so he's he's coming yes, up with. Yes, but the why? Why? Because if you take a look at the PAP, there are certain deficiencies with the current implementation. Which are um, limited look ahead, for example, and okay. the ability only to parse what is it context a certain level of context sensitive context context sensitivity is, is that what we're yes. looking for? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the idea is basically to replace the LL, the existing LL1 parser with something called the PEG parser. I don't know what this stands for. Parsing expression grammar. That's the one. Thank you very much. Um, yielding a more efficient, um, hopefully, parser, parser implementation. 
Mm. I mean, given the fact that this hasn't really changed since I think Python two, because Python because since then Python two has always used an LL one parser. Um, that's a pretty radical um, change, uh, but only under the hood because Python will stay the same. You're just changing the parser implementation. That's yeah, it is not really a, a noticeable um, change from a uh, yeah, Python user perspective, or, or <coughs> it's more a changing the engine underneath. Correct scenario. Yeah, I'm sure LL1 parser. And uh, yes, um, when I read the pep some time ago, mm. um, before I probably had too much beer, but we can cut this out. <laughs> <laughs> um, the current <laughs> LL1 implementation does doesn't do a pretty Sorry. good job on um, ASD uh, on on ASD generation, as in the absolute syntax tree. And Guido hopes with the pep. Um, that the AST generation will then be streamlined. This is the overall idea. Needless to say, also increasing um, the ST generation speed. Because yeah. that's, yeah, that's, if, that's, if you take a look at a benchmark um, uh -huh. where CPython spends its time, AST generation is a good chunk of this. Right. And every microsecond you can shave off here, uh, will uh, lower the startup time if you mm -hmm. if, if if you're feeding it the your, your usual a couple of million um, um, lines of code as part of your Python code base. Couple of million. The likes of Dropbox and so forth. Yes. Ah. I mean. Like the big code bases in Python, you'll notice it also with a couple of thousand lines, but the increase won't be that visible, of course. Oh, that's a bad idea. Okay. Um, right. Excellent. So, yeah, it sounds like it's still very much a uh, developing a live sort of language, which is good. Um, and I mean, this is what the PEP process yeah. is for, right? Making improvements. Yeah, of course. I mean, yeah, you can improve anything, right? But it's whether there is motivation or, or a need to do it. Um, so, but it's good to see that there is for something like that. Um, okay. okay, anything else in 3.9 that tickled your fancy? Mm, not as far as I can remember. I, there, there are, I reckon there are this, there's a multitude of improvements, but the, but this puzzle thing just immediately came to mind. Hmm. Okay. okay. But then yeah, I only read the, the peps every second day, not every day for breakfast, so that's okay. Hmm. 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 What is the... Um, the rest equivalent of a pep, is that a rep? Uh, it's called a. I knew it. Um, <laughs> no, it's not a rep. It's 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 <laughs> a, a, a yeah. request for a proposal, an RFP, I think. If I'm completely RFP? mistaken. Uh, yes. That sounds hmm. okay. Oh yeah. Fair or enough. request for improvement. It's it's on rustlang.org. There, there's a similar process in a place. Rip, a rip. Yeah, that sounds um, good. There's a similar process in place. Check out rustlang.org. Um, there's also, I think, a podcast tackling the, 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 the improvement proposals. But okay, the community okay. process is pretty similar to the existing, to the now existing, I might add, um, community process in Python, because Rust doesn't have a BDFL, if I'm not completely mistaken. Um, I okay. think it's government, uh, I, I think even Mozilla. It was, I guess it, it came from Mozilla, right? Yeah. So Mozilla handed yeah. this to the, to the community and it's now done via mailing list and all the rest of it, as usual. Mm. Cool. But is there some, uh, who makes the decisions on these? Uh, I think there's, there's some sort of community about. process in place. Okay. Um, maybe there's a language committee similar to, to the one, uh, to the one in Python. I do not know. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm, I'm just, I'm just curious. It's, uh, it's but unlike Oracle with its community RFC, process, yeah, RFC, <laughs> it's a real community one, if I'm not completely mistaken. Mm. Because I think the community process for Java doesn't deserve its name, if if memory serves correct. Oh, there is such a thing. Oh, there is, know, but okay. it's uh, yeah, mm. but I mean, uh, the ultimate decision still lies with Oracle. Yeah. All right, so um, final word on Python? Use it. <laughs> Simple. <laughs> okay, I think many many people do, yeah. So. Mm. That's uh, fair enough. Okay.
Okay, is uh, there anything else I should, uh, our listeners, uh, we, we talked about PEPs already. Um, if you encounter anything that you, that it doesn't make sense, feel free to go to python.org. Um, as in, mm. um, the sketch does revolve around the notion of PEPs, but we tackled this already. Um, if there's. And the specific PEP number of. Uh, yeah, there's 572. Uh, for the benefit of the listeners, this is actually the PEP where Hito decided he had enough of the shit and decided mm. to return the benevolent, the, the benevolent dictator of life ownership to the community. Um, PEP 7, and I think the, the, um, the sketch revolves around this 572. For the benefit of the <laughs> listeners, essentially it's an amendment to the language syntax that wasn't exactly um, a runner, let's put it this way, with the more purest there were, uh, yeah, so um, so members of the community that, way. <laughs> um, that hmm. do not necessarily um, wash with the community, let's put it this way. Well, wash with the community, but there, are also, there is probably worth mentioning the, the Zen of Python. Um, yes. You wanna, in that context. You want to explain the Zen of Python? I think that's PEP 8, right? Or PEP 4. I don't know the number, but there are... No, it's 20. Is there only 20? I don't know. I Perhaps, ahead. yes. Um, but, um, yeah, so, so like any good open source project, um, they have a set of rules, guidelines that they'd like to adhere to, um, and which is called the Zen of Python. I think uh, it's PEP 20. You're right, yes. Um, mm, so you got to mm. be concise... Uh, no shenanigans with the neighbors. Smoking isn't allowed. <laughs> you have to indent with four spaces or a tap, um, and no curly braces. Yeah. So that was a mistake, right? No, no, no. Actually, that's not in the <laughs> no. The tap stuff isn't in there. Um, but um, but yeah, the, was, but the indentation a, certainly is. is. I hope you uh, paid note to uh, rule number sixteen, maybe. Hmm. Anyway, let's not discuss the Xenophile. It's, it's, uh, you should, uh, anybody should read Pep it. 20, I think. Martin Schreiber. Mm. Even, Even though there's only 19, but yeah. Hey. There is? Um, I, I think there's more than like, pep, uh, one 800 of them these days. No, 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 no Pep's 19. <laughs> I'm, con <laughs> I'm confused. <laughs> The Zen of Python contains 19 rules. Ah, sorry, yes. <laughs> or, or gu guidances or... or <laughs> sorry, um, I beg <laughs> your pardon. <laughs> okay. Indeed. So you got to do Guido and I'm going to do the rest. Um, and let's start later. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's, it's called Guido and the Walrus. And let me, do yes. the, let me read the intro. Somewhere in a tiny house by the sea, set amongst tulips, our hero Monty is about to tuck into another piece of cheese to accompany his evening smoke and grulch. Goedenavond. I have a problem with your walrus. Oh, uh, yes, it was the problem. Uh, as far as I know, he's quite well. A colon equal to one could be used as a classic assignment, and then it's hard to explain to beginners why A equals one should rather be used as it looks the same and seems to behave the same. Whatever happened to there should be one, and preferably only one, obvious way to do it. Aha, I see. You clearly are a bad programmer coming out with a poorly constructed and complex sentence like that. I take it you are not referring to my magnificent moustache when you are talking about walruses? Nay. Neither are you referring to my large flippant pet marine mammal I keep on the Nomai beach? Nay. Well, in that case, dear Ralph, you have failed to comprehend commandment number 14, which clearly defines the way. Fourteenth commandment? I thought there were only ten, and I thought there were rules. Commandment number 14. This way may not be obvious at first unless you are Dutch. Goedenavond. Ja? I'm calling to say I'm completely in Raymond Hattinger's camp. What? I never knew Raymond was gay, so all the close attention on his part wasn't a token of him idolizing me? No, no. 
I agree with him that there is a sudden rush to add new features to the language, and some things are getting in there that don't seem thought through or finished. Yeah, another one who doesn't know the commandments. Right, right check, out check out commandment number six. Read a bit of the accounts. Do we? What new year? I really don't like this idea. It puts one of the worst parts of C into Python while making things significantly uglier. Hmm. I think you are mistaken. You can put a Python into the C, but not a C into a Python. Come to think of it, I'm not sure that Pythons can swim. And they say the Dutch are crazy. Dot scenes. Due to severe budget restrictions related to COVID-19, we were not able to afford a sophisticated set of sound effects this sketch deserves. So for the following, please imagine a bus arrival accompanied by crowd noise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Monty relights his smoke and takes a seat outside to gaze at the sweet pink tulip fields, only for the silence to be rudely interrupted by a coach of Polish tourists. Just are a I need to speak to you about my strong emotional reactions to Pep 572. I feel that name, colon, equals expression, doesn't fit the narrative of Pep 20. It doesn't remove complexity, it only removes it, and that's a bad barg bargain. Colon equal also goes against having one obvious way to do it. Hmm. Come sit and have a smoke. You don't seem to understand the usability improvements this will give. This sounds dismissive to me. I did read the pap and followed the discussion on Python Dev. It was meant to be dismissive. I'm tired of every core dev starting their own thread about how PEP 572 threatens readability or doesn't reach the bar for new syntax, etc. These arguments are emotional and subjective, and I haven't even mentioned you walk in all over my tulips. I personally think that multiprocessing is more performant than threading. This is how big decisions get made. Nobody can predict the outcome with sufficient accuracy. It's like buying a new house, or a new car, or a wife. In the end, you decide with your gut, as all they have in common is four wheels, in case of a car, some windows and doors, in case of a house, and, well, I don't need to tell you about women. Hmm. I refer to PEP20 because it distills what's unique about the value proposition of Python. It's our shared vocabulary. It's poetry, dear boy, not a set of axioms. You can't prove anything with an appeal to PEP20. You can appeal it for sure, but such an appeal, by definition, is subjective and emotional. Ha 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 ha, there's only one way to do it. Ha! Yes, there is. My way. Now get off my land. If now is greater than never, and never often is greater than right now, then it equals idea dot bad end. Blimey, you are one special case. But special cases are not special enough to break the rules. <whistles> Wally, go get him. A large walrus comes down the dune and squashes poor Lukash, quoting commandment number five, flat is better. Okay, who's Lukash? He's one of the people that wrote back about... He's actually quite an um, uh, important community member, to be honest. And <laughs> you may want to look him up. And so is Raymond Hettinger, I suppose. Yeah. I see. Um, okay. No, uh, let me... Oh, I've forgotten his name now, but he... Um, I think he's one of the five now. Uh, Lukash. Yeah. He's quite in five people that govern the project. Oh, okay, um, now that we have covered um, the second ep part of the bump episode on Python, maybe it's time for the feedback. And as a matter of fact, Claudio Miranda wrote, you really thought I wouldn't have done my research before recording? Fools! And then something laughing. I had already found out about the new pricing scheme from the inside source in the deep web way before my review. And given the changes and all the red tape usually involved with such things, 
I knew it was worth putting that information out there for humankind to behold. And since your assumption of my lineage was an extra benefit, and he says, I'm not Italian, I can now leak this cable from the Fratellanza, <laughs> the Correzioni. Fratellanza? Yes, it was in the sketch. And the uh, link mm -hmm. actually will be in the, in the, in the show notes. And then he says, hack the planet, the truth is out, uh, the truth is out there. I want to believe. And then it says, thanks for the recursive, Excellent. recursively, recursive review. Claudio. My skin is pretty thick. Regards, Claudio. Claudio, thank you very much for that feedback. Mm. Much appreciated. Sure. Now we know, um, that we have, that we gain attention all the time, which is good news. Because there's no such thing as well, bad publicity, it's right? Planet so, scale yes. hacking now. Aren't Indeed. We? So, yes, yes, <laughs> and ma what, what does that remind you? The truth is out there. I want to believe. That's actually a quote from a famous TV series. Yes. But maybe you are too. It's a sci-fi one. Uh, not necessarily. No. Well, to some extent, no. yes. Yes. Um, uh, say, uh, the X Files. Yes. X -Files? Very good, Martin. There's still hope, right? I knew it's, the it's, it's in it's in it's in there somewhere. Yes. <laughs> uh, you see, Martin. <laughs> yes, that means you are old because that show was popular <laughs> in the eighties, right? No, it was a bit later than that. No, eighties, uh, I think. Uh, okay, fair enough. Fair enough. It featured um, Skull, Skulder and Molly. Yes, something. and David. Well, but I, I, I can't even remember his second name. David Duchovny. Something Polish. Yeah, something. Yes. Of California yes, yes, Cation yes. fame, right? Very important. That was actually okay. his breakthrough before he went on to bigger things, the X Files. There we go. And uh, the lady's name is. I do not know, but she appeared in a number okay. of B class movies later on. <laughs> I mean, that was that was a yes. break, breakthrough too. But she, in contrast to David, she didn't make mm. much of it. I can't even recall seeing her in in in, in a couple of adult entertainment movies. Right. That friends keep talking about. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, okay. Uh, sorry, I was distracted by thinking of the name. Anyway, it doesn't matter. I'm sure um, there are websites out there telling, uh, which are able yes. to tell you exactly yes. that. Um, this is why okay. people don't have memories anymore, right? There's too many websites. Indeed, 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 indeed. Um, okay. Um, that was the only feedback on the on that episode. And again, Claudia, hmm. thank you very much for this. Uh, much appreciated. By the way, we love the alias. Uh, Martin checked it out. Apparently, mm. it's a photographer being featured or a filmmaker on, on IMDb. And uh, if it's not you, it looks pretty okay. The guy is like us, a little bit old, but we just love the hairdo. Really impressive. Yeah, it's, 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 um, it would surprise me if it was him, because, you know, filmmakers, open source, hmm. Hacker Public Radio. Uh, <laughs> it would be a very odd hobby to have, but it is stranger things have happened, right? Indeed. Speaking of Hacker Public Radio, yes, let's give them a plug. We are, we are still hosted on Hacker Public Radio. Ken, you're doing an excellent job. Never mind the recent email exchange. We still love you and Hacker Public Radio. And for the time being, we will remain on that platform, especially given the fact that we now have our, uh, that we now have our own RSS feed. The witches and doing daily episodes. Um, not doing daily episodes, no. No? <laughs> no, we are not. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> no, Hacker Public Radio talks about Ken two weeks from us. <laughs> um, between the shows. Yes. Ah. And Ken, that ha that your advice has been taken on board. We will rearrange the schedule. No worries. Um, okay. Is there anything left to talk about? Yeah, poxes. Yeah? Yes. Any poxes, Martin? Apart from the one that oh. I sent to you. <laughs> You sent me a yes. box. Which one? Um, I sent Martin a box about a TV series called The Secret uh, Diary of a of a Call Girl. Ah, TV. Yes, TV, yes, yes. yes. Um, have you checked out the episode? Does it have to be TV? No, it doesn't. No. Ah. That was my pox, Martin. That was your pox. Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, for see, those people, anyway, you can talk yeah. to talk to us about it. Uh, for those for, for those few listeners who don't know what I'm talking about, about hmm. 13 years ago, I think it was ITV or couldn't have been the BBC because it's way too, too what's the word I'm looking for? Controversial? No. Um, um, Entertaining? Uh, well, <laughs> you see quite a bit of skin, let's put it this way, and that wouldn't happen with the BBC. Explicit. Explicit, yes. Thank you, Martin. 
We'll get there. We'll get there. <laughs> okay. Yeah. No, uh, charge, this, no charge. Yes. I mean, you, I mean, they are not as explicit as your ordinary porn movie, no. But it's it's done very tastefully. But the TV series describes the ups and downs of a London-based call girl, especially her woes with rela- with relationships. And uh, the bit on IMDb and other platforms has drama, but it's it's rather funny mm. at times. Okay. So, Martin, if you have nothing better to do, check it out. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Yes, that um, has a catchy title, obviously, but I didn't get any further than that. That's just kind and, of and of course, the links will be in the show. The link will be in the show notes. Links, yes. links, yes, many links. Um, do you have a pox? Yes, I do have a pox to to make up for the non well, actually, for the non non <coughs> uh, tech related news. Yeah, Martin's pox. Wire, wire Martin's pox would be one point nine billion in his bank account. <laughs> <laughs> in case anybody's wondering, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think that would, probably would be the, not a very. Um, a sensible place to put it. <laughs> to it fair, depends but, on um, where that particular bank account is, Martin. Right. <laughs> I don't know. You tell me. <laughs> I wouldn't know what you're talking about. Well, where are your bank accounts? <laughs> I can't really talk about these things in public, Martin. <laughs> sensible, sensible. Okay. Um, yeah, so my pox of the week is actually 1.8 a... 1.8 billion? Um, no, no, no. No billions involved. Um, slightly more more um, interesting than money. Um, okay. Do you remember a uh, computer called the uh, BBC... Micro? Micro oh yeah, I do. Yes. It was that, that was which that was, was one of the code. first ARM implementations on the planet. It was, it was, and the people who designed this BBC? No, <laughs> <laughs> probably not. <laughs> ITV. <laughs> Man, you tell me. <laughs> no, there was a, a couple of um, uh, uh, people who designed this. One of them is um, uh, Dr. Sophie Wilson, and. I came across this um, great lecture uh, on microprocessors, uh, past and future, and where we are going. So it's about an hour and a half, no, a little bit over an hour and a half long, but it talks about the, um, you know, obviously the limitations and the history. Uh, it talks about the BBC Micro ARM and where, you know, where are processors going? So it is a very worthwhile. Um, so this is this lecture is done by the. Um, uh, one of the co-designers of uh, BBC Micro and ARM. So the link will be in show notes, people. In show notes, w- worth uh, worth a um, uh, a watch, listen um, if you want to be uh, less entertained than the Secret Diary of a Call Girl or whatever its okay, name is. I was. reckon I reckon <laughs> that the presentation is slightly more technical than the than the yes. TV series. But indeed, it's indeed. it's it's um, it's interesting because. This is where it all started because the BBC, or whoever con- uh, commissioned this this computer, was looking for mm. an inexpensive microprocessor at the time, and for some yep. reason they didn't want to go down the Rockwell route as in sixty five hundred two. Um, uh, there was something called sixty eight hundred nine already, and I reckon that was a little bit of a precursor to that ARM architecture, no. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but it's um, it was. I mean, this so, so this is quite an in-depth lecture, right? So it it, sh- it shows you the all the microprocessor designs of those times as well, and how the, um, the kind of the ARM design is different, and so on. So it's 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 mm. very much worth a um, if you, if you're into uh, microprocessors. But yeah. N- not everybody is. I mean, um, yeah. F- to be fair, I mean, RISC and ARM, of course being probably the most used risk uh, architecture on the planet, given its mm. mobile penetration alone, yep. goes back to, funny enough, actually, an, an, an co- a company called IBM. They used to do um, punch cards, and then they came around... <laughs> paper tape, yeah, paper yeah. tape, too. <laughs> and then they had this grand vision of that the planet only needs five computers, what was then known as a computer. Of course, they were slightly off with that assumption. But <laughs> uh, the rest is history. But at the um, around the fifties, okay. early sixties, they designed something called the, uh, they they designed a machine called the mainframe, which is now known as the mainframe, uh, as in big mm-hmm. machines, little memory, f- um, for the time for that time quite a, quite a lot actually. But that was actually the precursor to um, the multi the, the virtualized. 
multi-user multitasking uh, computers that we now know as Linux, Unix, you name it. Because the first virtu uh, the first hypervisor was actually called VM, and that came from IBM. And that was as early as 72, if I'm not completely mistaken. Around the same you, time... You're better at dates than um, I am, yeah. <laughs> Which is quite funny, because you are younger than me. Not much, but a little bit. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Um... Uh, at the same, I mean, and that mainframe architecture, just to kind of briefly shed some light on this, this mainframe architecture consisted of what would be now called a CISC, a complex instruction set computer, because it had many, um, machine, uh, many m machine instructions, it had many addressing modes and all the rest of it. And then somebody sat down and said, how can we save on this? And they ran, or he ran, a statistical analysis on Cobra compilers and assembler programs and all the rest of the typical applications that were then run on the mainframe and came up with the conclusion that about only about 20% of the instructions were really used. And hence, the reduced instruction set computer was born, then known as ROMP 801. And that was the first yes, commercial risk implementation on the planet, and the rest are just copycats. As in the Rockwells of the world... Uh, even 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 IBM copied that design for something called 60, 6150. That was actually the first RTPC with a RISC architecture on a kind of PC basis coming from IBM. I, I think I administered the first um, machine in Germany at the time in 86. That was running a modified version of AIX. Um, the Unix oh. then being deployed on that on that hardware, and of course we all know what came out of it, namely the PowerPC um, architecture that was used by Apple <laughs> in the early mm. Macs until they mm. decided to go for Intel, and now they're coming and around back. To, yes, <laughs> yes, <indeed>. because <laughs> as probably we, uh, yeah, yeah. most of you know by now, a a Apple has taken the step to something called A14 which essentially is their interpretation of an ARM architecture mostly used until now in iPads and iPhones. And there's a little bit of a juicy story, and that probably should have made it into the news, but apparently, and this is something that was leaked yesterday or the day before, we are recording this on the 26th of June, by an ex-Intel employee that Apple was so pissed off with the quality uh, of the Skylake line of of of, um, of CPUs that was in 2015 2016 that they decided it's enough with Intel we do we do our own thing it took them about their own sweet time as in four years but now they said that come I think the next Mac generation they would be based on A14s yep. 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 Um, with a lot of um, migration periods penciled in and dual binaries, as in fat binaries, as we had it when they switched from PowerPC to Intel. Uh, I think, when was it? 20, 2007 or something Ooh. like this? 2006? Maybe I'm wrong. Um, mm. I put a link into the show notes for a Wikipedia, Links, page, yes, for a wik for a Wikipedia page, page where you can read this up. But again, they have gone around full circle. Now let's see what comes next. Mm. Funny, a uh, very, very quick question on that. Um, do you remember what the first IBM PC was uh, priced at? That was not the XT, but the precursor. And I would be, I would, I'm, I'm guessing now, five to, five to seven thousand dollars. Yeah, I don't remember it being that high personally, but um, it wasn't cheap. Yeah, because f for the spec. Was, no, no, no. But, but yes, it's um, yeah, it's more for the spec. Yeah, but uh, in comparison to your. Uh, like your C64s or whatever, it was um, definitely ten times more expensive. I mean, IBM so. aimed this uh, at your at your at your office environment, and yes, uh, commercial indeed. stuff, indeed. and yep. 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 Um, yeah. I mean, I can recall owning a clone in eighty four, eighty five. Um, because I couldn't afford to buy a real IBM PC, and that clone was mm. was the same spec for about half of the price, give or take. That has an, that had an eighty eighty eight in it, sixty four megabytes of RAM, two floppy disks, hmm. and I later bought a hard disk for this, but it was a pretty clunky machine in comparison to now. 
but that was the first that was IBM Free Hard Disk. Yes. yes, of course. That was Damn. that was <laughs> IBM's first foray into the yes. microcomputer market oh, okay. on a sixteen bit basis. Um okay. and they chose Intel for this and not some proprietary well, mm. not uh, not their proprietary architecture. Um okay people, um thanks for uh, listening as usual please send feedback, feedback. Yes, yes please send feedback to feedback at linuxinlaws.martin EU. EU yes yes thank you for listening and speak to you speak to you soon at This could be your opportunity to sponsor one of the most popular open source podcasts on the planet. Boasting global listenership that goes well into double digits, we hope, Linux in Lars is loved by developers, ops people and diverse as in DevOps alike. So Redis Labs, Mongo and Couchbase. If you want to be part of the happening crowd, simply get in touch with our sales organization at sales at linuxinlaws.eu. And no, sponsorship is not confined to NoSQL database companies. We are happy to accept donations from operating system companies, middleware geeks, compiler projects, the yellow press in general, and Brad Pitt and Aliyah Shawkart in particular, as long as they are open source. This podcast is licensed under the latest version of the Creative Commons license, type attribution share alike. Credits for the intro music go to Blue Sea Roosters for the song Salute Margaret, to Twin Flames for their piece called The Flow, used for the segment intros, and finally to Celestial Ground for their song Sweet Justice, used by the Dark Side. You find these and other ditties licensed under CC at Chimando a website dedicated to liberate the music industry from choking copyright legislation and other crap concepts. Cut. Okay, should we do the dialogue now? If you like. I have still have beer, so that's Excellent, good. excellent. Okay. <laughs> um you do the uh Dutch parts because my Dutch is crap. <laughs> um, yeah. Um oh, sorry. Um do you want me to do the uh what's his name? Um add in the, the, the sounds and stuff to this one or are you happy to do that? No, I'm gonna do the post production, no worries. Okay. Okay, fine. Okay, um, before we go into the uh, dialogue slash sketch, um, yes. yes, there's a certain amount of Dutch involved. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm not too sure if the level of Dutch competency with our listenership is good enough to understand this. I mean, Goeden Avond is pretty much yeah. self-explanatory. Okay, but okay, okay. Um, good point, good point. Uh, let's have a think. Let's have a think. Uh, but I think, apart from the introductory uh, things, we should do this in English rather than Dutch. There's, there, there's, there's not that many, really. Is there? But, I can recall uh, at least one uh, one sentence. Okay. okay, okay. All right, I can do I can do that. It's fine. No problem. We'll go um, Dutch, English, yeah. Okay, cool. So you're gonna do Guido and I'm gonna do the Walrus. <laughs> 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 yeah. Excellent. Okay. Uh, uh, talking about walruses? Nay. As in Dutch for no. <laughs> Sorry. That's okay, no worries. <laughs> Go on. Okay. <laughs> well in that case, dear Ralph, you have failed to comprehend comprehend? Comprehend comprehend. <laughs> right. Start again, sorry. Cut that bit out. Commandment number 14. This way may not be obvious at first unless you are Dutch. Goeienavond. Geen geng. Ja. Geen geng. We're going to add this in later, yes, no worries. <laughs> Some sound effect. Okay.
<laughs> You've been listening to Hacker Public Radio at hackerpublicradio.org. We are a community podcast network that releases shows every weekday, Monday through Friday. Today's show, like all our shows, was contributed by an HBR listener like yourself. If you ever thought of recording a podcast, then click on our contribute link to find out how easy it really is. Hacker Public Radio was founded by the Digital Dog Pound and the Infonomicon Computer Club and is part of the binary revolution at binrev.com. If you have comments on today's show, please email the host directly, leave a comment on the website or record a follow-up episode yourself. Unless otherwise stated, today's show is released under a Creative Commons Attribution Sharealike 3.0 license.